I think the simplest way to understand it is that generative AI is AI that says something and agentic AI is AI that does something. And the idea is that you could really truly automate end-to-end -end processes. So that's essentially the beginnings of what we're starting to see with agentic. This isn't just a 5% productivity increase. This is a 98% productivity increase. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Insight in 15, KPMG's flagship podcast focused on the big issues facing business leaders today and in the future. I'm Stuart Burt, and today we're going to be talking about agentic AI. And I'm pleased to be joined by someone who was talking about AI several years before it was cool to do so. Paul Henniger, an expert in AI, digital and emerging technologies at KPMG. Welcome, Paul, to the podcast. Thanks so much. Good to be here. As ever, we've only got 15 minutes to go through what is quite a big topic, so we'll go straight to it. What is agentic AI and what's the difference to the other types of AI that we've seen? I think the simplest way to understand it is that generative AI is AI that says something and agentic AI is AI that does something. The slightly more complex way to think about it is, um, you know, if you wanted to sort of respond to a customer email or something like that, you could take the customer email, copy it into a chat GPT or whatever your system is, and say, here's the email. Can you tell me what the issue is and how to respond? And chat GPT or whatever the application is would tell you what to do, and then you could do it. Um, with Agentic AI, in essence, what you deploy are a set of agents that have slightly different tasks. So one of them will look for emails that come into an email box and read them, summarize them. Another one will classify what type of issue it is. Another one will take that issue and, you know, search for different resolutions to the issues. And then the fourth one will pick one of those resolutions based on the customer's information or whatever and literally send an email back to that customer with a link to whatever the resolution is. And the idea is that you could really truly automate end-to-end -end processes. Okay, and why now are we talking about it? Why in this particular moment in time because if i think about other big moments where there's been a spike in interest in ai it's been tied to the release of something like chat gbt what's driving the focus now on agentic ai i think the reality is the main thing um, that's happened is we're now in the sort of cycle where people are looking to actually realize the value of deploying artificial intelligence it's quite valuable to have a a very knowledgeable assistant to sort of recommend to you the action to take. I do that in the mornings. I say, like, can you look in my email and mm. you know, tell me what the big issues are so I know how to prioritize my actions. But if I wanted to take half the work out of my day, I need another set of AI to try to half resolve some of those actions, et cetera. So partly it's as uh, corporations, as institutions are actually looking to achieve cost savings, achieve automation rates, create the sort of potential for new that AI promises the uh, the way of deploying AI that, that we describe when we talk about agentic has to be the way that we do it. It has to start to take actions for us if we're going to get the efficiencies. That's the promise of the whole thing mm. to begin with. Mm. So we're moving towards that period of adoption in business and presumably some are already further along on that journey. If you're a business leader listening to this podcast, where do you start with that? What we've said for a while with clients um, is that if AI is going to, you know, be the key to a significant cost savings or is going to unlock a lot of value, it is going to solve the problems that are your biggest problems to begin with. So what we increasingly are doing is rather than trying to think about, you know, what things do we think AI might be good at, we simply take as a starting point, what are your biggest problems, you know, for a large retailer that might be the problem of waste in their stores or something mm -hmm. like that. For a financial institution, often they're very fixated on the amount of time and complexity involved in customer onboarding processes. And that's increasingly where we're focused. Um, if we can solve the biggest problems that our clients have, then not only have we achieved some value, then you've established the data infrastructure, the capability, the transformation processes, the sort of resource models, et cetera, that you're going to need to rework large tracts of how business is conducted, whether it's interacting with the customer or the back office and middle office processes that keep things running mm. day to day, basically. And so if you overlay with that sectors and the sector focus, are there some sectors that are further along that journey? You mentioned a few there. Presumably, there are also some that are a bit more risk averse, maybe some that are regulated industries, especially. How do you see that playing out across different sectors? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, as with anything, there are sectors that are a little further ahead than others. Um, although 
uh, one thing that's fascinating is it's not necessarily the regulated sectors that are trailing behind in some respects. Uh, so, for example, life sciences is one of the most advanced sectors in the use of AI, and that's right at the core of their business model, i.e. Uh, they have been for years trying to deploy and have succeeded and started to succeed in big ways in using AI to develop new chemicals and drugs and things which are then scaled out in the rest of the business. Um, and that's despite the fact that there's significant regulation, not just at the edges of what they do in terms of marketing, but at the core of how to do that safely. And so in places, what we're seeing is you know, organizations that are most constrained either because of market conditions or regulatory conditions or a combination of those things are the ones that are uh, most motivated to be aggressive in terms of understanding what it's going to take and getting some examples and creating a real program of transformation in order to deliver the value of AI quickly. Yeah, great. And you mentioned a few of the tasks that it's particularly good at focusing on agentic AI. On the flip side, are there any where you'd recommend you wouldn't want to deploy it quickly or you take a bit more caution over? In general, um, what I would say is that it's not a question of whether AI is appropriate to things, but how complex and costly would it be um, to do all the engineering work and possibly some research and development required to attack a problem. Um, so what we found is that, uh, you know, significant chunk, chunks of what, what we do in companies, you know, the finance function, the HR function, the risk function, as well as customer interactions and even product development, all of those things are things that can significantly be enhanced with AI. Um, and and we have found in places that, you know, uh, you can get so far, you can get a 50% automation rate and going further than that's going to require some technology development. Mm -hmm. Part of the key is understanding whether you're at that sort of you know, event horizon of this is about as efficient as we're going to get now. Let's move to the next problem. What's the most interesting example you've seen so far in terms of deployment of agentic AI? I think one of the most effective ones we've seen is not possibly uh, sort of cocktail party interesting, but it's been incredible in terms of how it just made a process go away. And that's around invoice purchase order matching. So this is something that happens thousands of times a day at a decent sized company. A vendor issues an invoice. Someone has to check to see if that invoice actually matches what it does. And mostly that process is done quite manually. What we found is that you can easily deploy an agentic system that reads both of those documents um, that determines whether the information and documents matches on a kind of qualitative basis. And so we've gone at multiple clients from, you know, uh, a cost of processing those from 35 pence per invoice that comes in to literally less than a single penny per uh, implementation. And those those just run 100% of the time. This isn't just a 5% productivity increase. This is a 98% productivity increase. And is this just something that is in reach for the largest corporates out there, be it because of capacity, be it because of cost? I mean, the simple answer is no. The first project that I worked on that used uh, AI to sort of automatically process uh, um, resumes or CVs and sort of match them with jobs was literally 25 years ago. The difference between doing that today and doing that uh, 25 years ago is that we needed 100 people and it cost, you know, 20 million pounds just to build one little thing. Whereas today you could, you know, probably build something that does that in a week with, you know, three people and some commodity software. Um, so what that means is that although obviously uh, an organization with more resources and more engineers has an advantage. The thing that's mainly changed is that you don't need hundreds and hundreds of engineers to make progress with this. The big elephant in the room is jobs and the impact that Agentic AI especially will have on, on the jobs market. What's your current take on where that's heading? Certainly it's going to be disruptive and we've already seen um, that certain skills are absolutely more critical and in short supply and other skills are sort of more impacted. Um, but our experience has been that every time a significant disruptive technology has been introduced, although it's disruptive, um, ultimately it's, uh, it's, it's job creating in equal measure. The whole purpose of this is to create even more value than we're able to create today. That means new jobs, new experiences, new careers. Um, so ultimately, I think if we do this the right way, this will be an absolutely positive experience for everyone and everyone will participate in that value creation. And I know this is something at KPMG, we talk a lot about the importance of trust in AI. How do you see, particularly moving into this agentic AI period, the trust debate evolving? We all have a vested interest in, in an ethical, moral deployment of these types of solutions. Mm. You know, you want to make sure it's not going to go off and do something unintended that has significantly negative impacts on people. The reality is that the reason that we need to be able to trust AI 
is partly that, but also if we're going to scale this, if you imagine a scenario in 18 months where you have tens of thousands of tiny little AI robots all going around and talking to customers and things like that, if you're going to be able to manage that and keep control of it, you need the ability to monitor these things. You need to mm -hmm. be able to define what is the individual outcome I'm expecting from all 14,000 of my little new robot employees. So on some level, um, trusted AI is important, not just for legal and ethical reasons. It's important because we can't pragmatically think about scaling these solutions unless we can understand them, monitor them, adjust them back on course um, and be sure that they're achieving the outcome that we intend. And so there is an infrastructure that needs to be built out, a uh, human infrastructure, a uh, policy and controls infrastructure, a technical infrastructure. If you're a chief executive, what are, you, what are the questions that you're asking your executive team to really drive the deployment of agentic AI? It's a good question. I think, I mean, my starting point for that is some of the own work that we've done, where we've asked ourselves that question mm -hmm. as we think about how do we provide our services um, and the impact that AI is going to have. We've thought about a few things, and, and in essence, we've started and continue to recommend the same thing with clients. Um, I mean, the first thing is, what are your biggest problems? You know, the, the, the things that are the significant bottlenecks to opportunities for growth. The second question is, you know, how do I marshal a real transformation effort? So yes, of course, you need to deploy engineers. You need to identify the pilots that you're going to do. But the, the real potential of AI comes from the transformation. You need to change the processes around it. If you automate half of a process, you need to think about how to rework the process on either side of the big auto Information that you've done. You do need to think about the resource and the people model. If people are going to need new skills, you need to find an efficient way to get people with those skills or to get the people that you have new skills. Um, you do need to think about the financial and commercial aspects. So we need to get ready for not just a, a, a technology project, although obviously that, um, but a whole transformation of, of everything in and around that technology project. Mm -hmm. I would say the third thing is it is important to think about data. And data tends to be both more and less important than everyone thinks. Um, it's definitely not the case, and it's never been the case, that we, you know, we should all get busy getting data perfect. There is no such thing as perfect data. Or perhaps more to the point, data is only perfect when it allows you to achieve an outcome. So this comes back to your biggest problems. You, there is a lot of data work to do, but there's specific data work to do in order to solve a problem. And that's not every single piece of data in every corner of every server and every computer, you know, for the entire history of an organization's operation. If I were to build an agent tomorrow as a business, what would I need to do right now? You, you literally do need AI, so you need a large language model or some type of algorithm that takes information, looks for a pattern, and then triggers something or other. Interestingly, you also need some more conventional technology. So you need a workflow platform or an automation platform or a finance platform, some place to run the software. Um, and then you need a sort of place that it's going to go look for data, which can be a very complicated modern data platform, or it could just be a you know, a folder on a SharePoint. You need an engineer. Typically, it's good if the engineer has a bit of mathematics so that they understand what they're getting themselves into. Importantly, you need someone who understands the domain. If you're going to solve a customer problem, you need someone who understands a customer. If you're going to solve your own email problem, you got to understand what you're trying to accomplish from an email point of view. So on some level, it's like any software project. You need some specific technology. You do need an algorithm. Um, and then you need a few people who can you know, come together to solve the problem and make the problem real uh, and deployed and uh, demonstratable to everyone who's going to come around and see your agent when you're done with it. Well, the objective that we set at the start was to keep this to 15 minutes. So I will start to close it with the final question that we ask everyone who comes on this podcast, which is that if you were to provide our listeners with one thing to take away in terms of adopting agentic AI, what would it be? I would say uh, the most important thing and the thing that I've uh, relearned, I would say, in the last three years is to remember that AI is a transformation problem. It's not a technology problem. The technology is fascinating. You know, the recent releases uh, that people have brought to market are bringing new capabilities every day. The research that's going on is going to make new things, you know, possible in six months that weren't possible today. Um, but ultimately, AI is a massive transformation. And so thinking about, you know, right to left, what do I want my company or my division or my team or my department, my ministry to look like in three years is the starting point. And then the question is, what's the path to get there? But ultimately, it's it's a transformation problem and requires that we set an ambition for that transformation. The technology on some level is straightforward. Um, it's the thinking and the strategy that's absolutely the key starting point. Great.
Thank you. Well, that is all we have time for today. Just time to say thank you to Paul for all your insight and wisdom on a very interesting topic. If you do like the podcast, please do like and subscribe on all the major platforms. And we'll see you again on the Insight in 15. Thank you.